Uh, uh, Joe and her group have taken the time and the effort to try to find some some of us that might have been around and, and uh, some of the founders of some of the micro sort of stuff and, and to get a gathering put together. It's, it's just, it's wonderful. Thank you very much, Joe, and all the staff for having done that. We love but, it. Because some of us have aged some <laughs> since, since we started this whole thing. And uh, I'm probably the one of the youngest out of the group that kind of kind of remember very much of it. Uh, my dad owned the Amos companies in northeastern Oklahoma and Borderville and here. And so we got to go to all kinds of events from college high school football games and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or the micro races or whatever or the Dewey races or whatever happened to be going on and so I was about 15 years old I guess at the time 14 15 16 through there and so I got to know a lot of the people among the racing family and the names and that sort of thing and so unfortunately though when I went off to college in about 1965 I missed all the racing in Bartersville it went on from 1965 until I got back and retired at 2010 so I missed it all in the middle but I still recognize a whole lot of the names and because we've all gotten older and I've been gone a while I'd like just quickly if you'd introduce yourself and uh, because some of some of us have aged a lot <laughs> I wouldn't have known Alan, Alan Graham Jr. if I had run into him at the Sheriff's Department. I didn't ever. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, let me start right here. Back to that. That Proctor, Ace Class. All right, Ace Class. All right. I was a, just attended. Attended? All right, well. And, and you probably still have most of your money in your pocket. The rest of it's still. Donnie Castile, just a 12 year old fan. Yeah. My dad pitted for 16, Jimmy. All right. That's great. Now, Alan Graham Jr., uh, retired 2005, knee camp funeral home. So I didn't have to take her and bury any of them, but they, they were quite close to my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, West Paskowski, I remember it, but I was pretty young. Yeah, I heard there was free refreshments this morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a Baptist background now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See how that was. All for free food, I tell you. We call it Baptist bait. Baptist bait. You're on the back row. Free food. And here you are. Kenneth? Kenneth Tate, I was, when they first started the program, I was one of your first flagmen, but I had to help my dad haul hay, and a lot of times I couldn't go, so I turned it over to Paul. Yeah. And he carried that on for a long time. Sure did. Yeah. Yeah. I'm nobody. I just came because it's cool. Is it cool? <laughs> free food. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's cool. Yeah, okay, cool. All right. Paul? My name's Paul Fox, and I'm probably with Kenneth from Dodham, and some of the original people that started the body. Wow. I was going to say something about stone tablets, but I'll pass. Hey, <laughs> Brown? Yeah. Go over car number 59. Number 59. Kind of maroon color, what? Yes, it was. All right. Let's see. Was that Paul Heat believer? Yeah. Yeah. It was in the first day. Yeah, first one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yep. I'm Jim Cable. Uh, my car was yeah. number 16. It was a industrial flathead class. So I ran the Mustang engine. All right. And uh, it's pretty good for the first year. Right? Yeah. As a, as a to me that was the old Red Coonfield body style. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Betty White. Betty White. Spared to Wesley. Yes. He drove 14, 112, and 8, and that's all I remember. Yeah, all right. I'm Kevin White. I'm Wesley's son. All right, Kevin. Glad you're here. I'm Kevin Glass. I run 60. Mercury. John, were you the one with that Mercury? There was a Mercury that ran that when it went around the track smelled like fresh burn mode onions. Good <laughs> Before Pete Hodges died, I, I was visiting with Pete and, and, and I'm saying, Pete, you remember there was there was there was a high winding thing. I think it might have been a mercury, but when that went around the track, is that it smelled like freshly mowed onions. He said, oh, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. He said, I remember I got behind him once. And he said, I could pass him, I had a better car. But he said, my eyes were teared up so bad, I couldn't, I couldn't see where I was going. That wasn't your car, huh? I'll give you credit for it, though, because we don't have anybody to argue about that. You know? 
I'm 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 Don Gillum. I grew up I, I grew up on Chickasaw, about two blocks from or a block from Craner's ambulance service yeah. up there. And uh, I was a fan when I was a kid. I, I, I still remember one time on an early morning Sunday paper out. They had like the Nationals out there, and and I. So I got showed up about six o'clock in the morning. I could sneak in. I didn't have to pay. It yeah. was like fifty cents, but I didn't have to pay that fifty cents. Yeah. So, but, yeah. We all learned those tricks. But, but I, I grew up just, just I, I loved hearing those little motors scream when they were practicing and stuff out there. So yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Some of us talked about that earlier uh, while we were getting ready. Is that we probably couldn't get away with that today, could we? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I just found recently that there were people who complained about it. To me, I, it was just music to my ears. I oh, yeah. Just used to it. <coughs> I'm, I'm nobody. You, you I, I'm just, just a, yeah, yeah. I'm just interested. First, I'm Curtis Bailey. I started racing out there when you guys put cages on me. I came in the game. Yeah? Uh, back in the 80s. Oh, whoosp. Yeah. You should have run them when the roll cages were below the back of your neck. Yeah. And there were no fuel cells. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to push start. You probably had a starter. No, we didn't have to. Oh, yeah. Well, I did, but she didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. 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 Seven. I actually started, I pitted for Mike Sawyer in 79, and I worked together. Yeah. And my dad raced at Dewey, yeah. so racing has been in my blood my whole life. And uh, actually, it was a lot of fun out there racing. I was yeah. president of the club in 84. Yeah. And yeah. You know, back then, it was, then there was a lot of, of course, I'm sure in all the eras, you know, you had, had the competition. and. Around in this area, if you could win around here, you could win anywhere in the country. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. And man, we used to have them cars come up from Oklahoma City and Tulsa every Saturday night. I run double A twin then, and and it was it was I mean we'd have 55, 60 cars every Saturday night, and it was really tough. Tough to make the A feature. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You made the A feature, you was happy, and uh, but it was really fun. I enjoyed being president in '84. We made a lot of improvements at the racetrack and bought a diesel road grader to uh, grade the track. Court Grandstaff was, uh, he was my vice president. Him and I were good friends and we worked together, we're still good friends. And, but it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. The idea of having, having 50 cars show up and now we're running at, at, at Tulsa, an average weekend show is 160 cars. Yeah, I'll race down there some. It was, uh, it, it was, Dog eat dog down there too. But the same still true. If you can win at that local track, yeah, you yes. can win just about anywhere in the country. That I is can, true. I can remember. <clears throat> that's a very true statement. Because guys all got together and went to Owensboro for the first time. Yeah. So it must have been '61 or two. And when it got time for the trophy dash. It was just a Saturday night down here. Yeah, <laughs> the Bartlesville race. It was. Yeah. The top six cars were all from Bartlesville. Wow. Exactly right. Yeah. And uh, and and when you look at the national chassis that are that are winning, Sawyer chassis are, are still still on the top of the pile. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Sawyer to me was a genius. Yes. He really was. He. I used to go out of his shop. Mike and I'd go out there. We had more fun. I mean, that guy. He he was. He was, he was a genius. I mean, he could set up a mold and pour a cylinder or piston, yeah. machine them. He did everything. This guy was, and he was a super good guy. Yeah, yeah. He really was. A creative was. engineer. That's yes, he was. He could, was. he could do anything. Him and Johnny both. Yeah. Yeah. They could do anything. Bobby and Mike, I mean, they're... Thanks. Well, Bobby, anyway, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Lloyd? Uh, I'm Lloyd Coke, and I was just a fan. I, I attended practically every race they had, and I worked out in the, oh, the center field. And when it spin out, they wanted me to go and push them. And this one night, I when I spun out, and I was running up there to, to help him out, and he started rolling backwards and took off and took after me. Yeah, he came back in the infield, and I gave him the show for the night there. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I remember about the whole thing. <laughs> Those conics would run backwards for quite a ways, wouldn't they? Yeah, Basically, them single, yeah. single cylinders. Single cylinders, yeah. Almost a lap. 
<laughs> Chase you all the way to pits anyway. I'm Jim, Jim Franks, and I was just a spectator. I yeah. just watched the races. Well, we see now and in, in a lot of the, lot of the what's now called micro sprints, uh -huh. is yeah, that yeah. Uh, okay. the spectators are just really just kin folk and friends. And uh, we're in, in the old Bartersville days. I remember the, the community showed up. We we would all just yeah. yeah. And if you forgot about the races, you could hear them. Oh, well, it's time to go. <laughs> There's our hot laps. So so we need we need to go. All right, here's some history down here. Okay. <laughs> I'm a freeloader. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that works good. Daddy worked on the cars and mother raised them. Yeah. My name is, was Conover. You know, Woody. Woody, Woody I Conover. Conover and, uh, on her. Pump days and, and all that sort of uh -huh. stuff. And so, uh, and so while they were working on the cars, I got to hang around and go to the races and stuff. That's, that's good. So. And, and, you, and your mother drove a time yeah. or two. Yeah. Yeah, she drove. Yeah. Wow. Different generation. Donna, everybody knows Donna. Yeah. No, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, they will. I'm Donna Sawyer. I was the first secretary treasurer when we formed the club originally. And I was director of competition for several years also, national director of competition. I've been pit steward. <laughs> I've been flagman. I've been scorer. Yeah. Anything they had to do, I did. <laughs> You've been the one keeping Bob awake and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, my yeah. car number was 19. My husband's was 91. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm Paula Craner, and I'm the daughter of Paul Fox and Donna Sawyer. And I just, I was lived at the track as far as I know. <laughs> but I did scorekeeping, too, whenever, you know, I got... To where I could, so I kept score also, and then we were all the time doing upkeep on the track. So painting, concession stands, whatever we we just did it. So <laughs> I think we could get a crew together. Maybe she could go out there and get the truck fixed up. You think? Exactly. All right. Not a deal. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the eyes have it. I guess. <laughs> you got your job. I would still like to talk to you about that one night scorekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> This was mine that night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! I used to run some Oklahoma and Texas stuff, and if I, if I used my Oklahoma address and ran Texas, I didn't do very well for some reason with scoring. Well, it went the other way, and then, so I lived in Texas for a long time. I come back and I'm just racing in Oklahoma, and I didn't score very well there either. It seems to be that you might have had that problem. I don't know. It's that non-college high school thing, maybe. <laughs> Well, let's kind of start with kind of where it all began, and uh, and the dates and time. And, and Donna mentioned that she was one of the, one of the original founders, and I, I think uh, I think Kenneth was a part mm -hmm. part of the original uh, founder sort of stuff too. So that was in somewhere about 1958. Is that kind of where we started? Before then, kind of before, before then. then. We became official in 58 with a uh, uh, designation of the club, or maybe 57. 57. We, we, it was originally, we formed the club in 1957, late in the year, and we joined the Nationals in 1958. Oh, joined the Nationals, okay. Yeah, so so how far behind was Bartersville against against uh, sort of the national movement in micros? Did, did they have a couple of three years head start on us, or did they have a 10 year head start? Or when? <clears throat> yeah, there were a lot of clubs ahead of us, uh, the West Coast California and Indiana. Okay. And Illinois had clubs before we did. Okay. And Carlsbad had yes. one too. Everything close. They moved to the center of the yeah. country. And uh, there had to be tracks someplace because <clears throat> I don't know originally how Bob got involved in it, but I remember that uh, we pulled his car and we went to Embora, Kansas and raced quite a few Sundays. And I, how he found out about it, I have no idea. You, you know, how he found out about the track in Emporia. Well, they used to race at Oklahoma City, too. Yeah, I, know, but I do know Oklahoma City. Yeah. TV's first car was from Oklahoma City. Yeah. I do know when Bob was first making them, he'd take a U-joint for the bearings, for the steering. He made all, all of that stuff. He, he'd stay awake till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and have to go to work. Yeah, yeah. 
and he had a little old lace that one man could pick up and carry. My Who's that? Done all of that all night. Who knows? Yeah. Trophy girls. Well, so, so if we. It, we kind of got the club sort of organized somewhere in that 57, 58 period. So the, so our our own track appeared about when, when middle did, of the 1958. Middle of 58. Summer. Yeah. And so I was there when we scraped the grass off the. Of is that right? <laughs> so that yeah. that was Walt Walt Thompson's. Walt yeah. Thompson's land. Land. Yes. And. Uh, it, what was the thought process of, of how much banking or how big we going to make this thing or I don't think there was much talk about banking yeah. at that yeah, just, time. We just it get the grass long, off of it and avoid the two big yeah. trees. And the size didn't matter at that time either. But yeah. when we joined the Nationals, they had specific Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Things that you had to go by. Okay, where are they? Where Specific are they? measurements for the track and for the banking, for everything. Okay. And within those specifications? It had to be an eighth of a mile on the pole. Eighth of a mile on the pole. Yeah. All right. right. And, that's, and so we have tracks. There that they gave a specification of how wide the track was, I don't remember, but it had to be so wide. Mm -hmm. And the yeah, bank, they do, like she said, the bank had to be a certain degree. Wasn't as much as it is now, but it was, you know, it was a little enough to keep the car from going too far. But I don't know if we had some that I've seen went over the bank with high banks. Yes. Well, I've had so a couple. They didn't have any specifications on the fence or how high it could be or how low or because in in Lemoore, California, they just have a guardrail like, like we do on the highway. highway. Right. Wow, a lot of hay bales. A lot of hay bales. Yeah, yeah a lot of hay bales. <laughs> so how many of us here have busted a hay bale by, by chance? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you've seen it. You've heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not, somebody knocked him into the one. <laughs> I don't think there was many <laughs> oh, oh, as far as yeah. the shape, actual shape of the track, like the length of the straightaways and stuff. Okay. So the Bartlesville track had long straightaways and corners. Tighter turn, and yeah. If you could set up to run on that track, you could run on just about any track. Coffeyville had a track and it was also an eighth mile asphalt, but it was more oval shaped mm -hmm. and uh, it was a lot easier to get around the corner. Yeah. Uh, so how many of you have been down to see the, well, see or have driven on the Tulsa yeah, track yes. now that's down in Port City or the yes. old Rougeau yeah. track? A while back, I was asked. Uh, Rick may Rick may have run on it once. Yeah, Rick. Rick, did you ever run on, on Rougeau or the Tulsa yeah. track? It was Rougeau. Yeah. 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 And and how did it compare to the Bartlesville track on size and banking? Well, actually, they're the same size. They're eight mile, and back then Rougeau was sanctioned by the National Modified Midget Association and. We had to send in our, I mean, our, like Donna was saying, I mean, the track had to be eight miles eight on miles. one side, and you had to send in <coughs> it out wide and, uh, to get a sanction, to get sanctions for run. Yeah. And uh, Rujo, actually in 1980, Rujo was fairly flat, and they banked that thing in 81. That's yeah. when they banked it. Banking it, it's, it's got really banked. Yeah, they really banked it high in Bartlesville. It was dirt then, that's after they knocked the asphalt off of it. but. Uh, Bartlesville was a pretty flat track. It never was bank very much, but it was the track it was fast. It was. So the aerial photograph uh, of the of the track that's over here on the wall. There's a one that's a little bit a picture of that that's a little older than that <coughs> that was on some old Google Maps. And so I had pulled those up and had dimensioned them because Google would allow you to run tracers on that so you could get the dimensions. And so we were asked to compare the, the Bartlesville track to the Rougeau track. And over time, they, the way they have graded Rougeau <coughs> is that now it's smaller than the original Bartlesville track. Oh, really? So it's, it's, it's dimensionally shorter, I'm going to say 20, 20 feet, I think it's 20 feet, 20 feet narrower and 40 feet shorter than the original Bartlesville track. But it's the same sort of thing. If you can if you can win at Rougeau on that track, you can uh, you can win just about any place in the country. 
Well, so that's kind of how the, how the club started, and, and some of the other names, let's see, uh, Johnny Pearson was, what, the first president. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, Donna was secretary treasurer, and Kenneth was flagman, promoter, and do whatever we need to do guy. Um, let's see, who else, who else did we have in that original group? Anyhow, those were the people. We talked about kind of the beginning of the track. And did, did Walt Thompson help maintain it? So we used yeah. Walt's land yeah. and Walt's yeah. equipment. And so then Walt was the one, and Walter Roy then would, would help kind of kind of maintain it. He had the, he had the tour equipment. Yeah, so he had, had equipment, knew what he was doing. So that's that's kind of the, the history of the track. So it so once we got it scraped, when did it get asphalt? Well, I think we had one national, I, I think. It, it seems like, if I remember right, we ran in uh, 58, and they had a national in, in Carlsbad, and there was about four of us went to Carlsbad to get the, the race here for 59, if I remember right. Is that right, Donna? You remember <laughs> that? <laughs> I'm looking at pictures. <laughs> and uh, we went down and, and uh, applied to get the uh, a race here in 59 and uh, if I remember right we got the race in fact we got the race for two or three years in a row there for a while but then it was dirt track for I'm going to say two years maybe two and a two three years I it's kind of hard at my age you know mm -hmm. I'm here to even kind of figure out where I'm at <laughs> no but uh, they uh, we had a lot of cars from the West Coast that came, a lot of cars from Oklahoma City, a few from North Carolina. And at that time, uh, we had uh, one, the first race, I think we had 75 or 80. And it was a national sanction race. And I don't remember if it was the... Uh, I think we had the first nationals in 1960. 1960. Race. I think it was. Yeah, 1960, yes. 60 was the first national race. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, but we had one race, one big track. race before that. Yes, it was black top. Yeah. And then, yeah. I don't remember, it seemed like, then we, after we had the first big race, then uh, somebody talked to Philip, something said if we change the race to Philip 66, they would black top. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that, that was how uh, Phillips name got involved in the track before 1960. Now, because it yeah, used to be Riverside Speedway. National races yeah. there for about sure did, what, three yeah. races, three nationals in a row, or four? Three. Four. And they changed it to 66. 62. 63. 64. Uh, yeah. So, well, it wasn't 64, was here too. Yeah, that's why. 65 is in the yeah. There was one here in 64, but that's when I sold my car. We went to Carlsbad, New Mexico in 1959 to ask for the Nationals in 1960. Yes, that's the way I remember too, Don. Yeah. And so... And somehow or other we got it. Yeah, so having, having the Nationals here in 60, and it was asphalt then. then. Yeah. Did we have a couple of years prior to that that was asphalt? No, prior I don't to think it was asphalt in 60. Yeah, it was well, dirt in 1958. In 1959, we put down a, a blade mix. They just hauled it in in dump trucks and took a grater and a, a roller and, and spread it out. And it was not dusty. That was the best thing about it. Yeah. Okay. It, was, it was lumpy and not real smooth. Okay, Boots, Adams. Yes, yeah. His, so we were the only track in the United on the States that had trees he in had the infield. Trees. He had pressure to get the kids off the parking lot, so he made the yeah, that, club a deal to, to uh, yeah. that Phillips would put a asphalt track, whatever we wanted, uh, with two strings. One was change the name of the track to the Phil 66 Speedway, and the other was to let the go-karts have it two days a week, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's how I got on it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I was racing, racing go-karts with, with Kenneth and Gary and, and Steve uh, Adams. Yeah, so in 19, starting in 1960, we had the, the good asphalt. Had the good asphalt. Yeah. Well, it must have been about 
about the time I, I got on this. Uh, in 1960, Marty Robbins came. Yeah. yeah. The big iron special. I remember that one. Yeah. All right. Did did that promote it more locally or saw your engines when yeah. they were developed? Yeah. So 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 how 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 did Bartlesville get known as kind of the center and the hub, at least in this part of the world, of, of being the micro center, the micro capital, this is where the good drivers are at, this is the good track. Marty Robbins is showing up. Once we're having, came, we're having it, nationals it here. No, what yeah, no, what, what did that? Was that just because we had some really good talent in town that was yeah. building some good engines, building some good cars, I, I think, or because well, of, of Marty Robbins uh, and others? Uh, car I think it's mostly because we were centrally located. Oh, that yeah. the people yeah, from yeah, both yeah. coasts yeah. could come here and race yeah. without traveling. Real okay, so far. yeah, the central location worked yeah, good, and then having right. a good track didn't hurt. Having a name out probably didn't hurt, but it's probably probably more geographical than anything else. Then, and it's not a real expensive place. Having been to both of those coasts, everything costs a lot more at, at each coast, and so there were some economics maybe. In, in but it was a place. And Bob introduced the first single Koenig engine because he raced boats before. Yes. And so he put a single Koenig in his car. He won the Nationals in Illinois, no, Logansport, Indiana. Uh, Charleston. No, Charleston. it was Charleston. Charleston. Charleston, Illinois, yeah. Well, that was kind of uh, like she said. He and I both worked for Halbert at the same time. He worked at the boat department, I worked in front of the brake car, car shop. And, uh, when they uh, ran the Koenig cylinder on the, on the speedboats, he and Alberti got together and decided, hey, why couldn't we get one of these to work up on them <laughs> and, a, and a race car? So, knowing Bob and them two together, both of them's minds going like this, so they decided, hey, we'll build a gearbox and put on that car, an engine, and put it in a car. So they did. And it won. And they used it for, I'm going to say, for two years. And then, well, they say, hey, we got a twin cylinder coming in from scream louder and harder and faster. <laughs> so we get that. So the, I think the first year that they used twin engine, Dieter Koenig from Germany came. Yeah. He was here for an international race to see what his engines would do in. And of course, at that time, there was other guys trying different engines. Jim Claus tried to Anzetti, which was a mighty fast engine for the way it ran. Johnny Pearson and, ran an and, uh, Indian. Also, John Glass and some other guys ran some Mercury's. They also did good. GB ran uh, a Triumph. Uh, GB ran a Triumph. And Johnny yeah, Pearson yeah. ran a When Indian. they started, you know, it's kind of amazing. I, I don't remember what, what kind of engine Bob had when we used to go to him for it. But they used to have what they call a flat, a, a open class and a and a flathead. A flathead was a Cushman and a bus thing. But then later on, uh, Bob and Johnny read some uh, Indian arrows or Triumph bike engines. Mm -hmm. But they put them behind the engine and, and ran both. Uh, then, uh, they used those, and but they had a lot of Cushman's running barbell, and there was a lot of mechanics that could really work on the Cushman engine and make them go. But the problem with the Cushman engine, when you ran it a long time, it would get hot and seize up on it. So they had to stop and let it cool off. Like that man over there said, he'd stop in the infield, and pretty soon he'd get freed up and up and get <laughs> So. Clint Klopp was running the Atlanta and he ran quite a few races, won quite a few races. Some guys from Carolina came with him and they was just keeping up with him. So let's say the Bob says, well, hey, we need to do something. Keep that old Clinton before he'd run. So one winter they decided to encase the air cool coolant and make it water cool. And so when he did, Look out. Everybody wanted a water cool cushion. So Bob, you know, sold water cool cushion in. 
in the meantime, he's developing all this stuff. Of course, they had to go back and build a, a gearbox for the twin. And then by this time, you would have a lot of guys coming in from all the country. A lot of guys from Oklahoma City, the Roof Brothers came in from Oklahoma City. And uh, then you had uh, Red Gilmore came in, and two or three guys from Texas came up here. We had one guy from some little old cattle town in Texas. He had a little inn in there, and you talk about running. I mean, that was the fastest little open car I ever believed I'd ever seen. So that's when they had to say, well, that guy can run that. We need to work on somebody so we can make them run better, which they did. But, uh, but we had a lot of competition, just can tell you, and not also from various other organizations. Later on in the middle <coughs> of the 60s, Jim remembered, Jim, because he ran, I think, didn't you run a Mustang, didn't you? They had some guys came in from Alabama, took the twin parties and cut them in two. You were talking man. about a thopper. Half they early. came and they would have to let them run for about 15 or 20 minutes before they'd start a race because they'd have to let that old bike hands and warm up for them to get up performance. But they'd get about four or five to have a race. Sounded like a bunch of 18 warriors coming. But they were enjoyable, they had a good time. Everybody that we came to Barville had a, an awful good time, and I think that was the reason some of these others, probably like the man said, that uh, Marty Robbins came, but Barbie wasn't the only one. He was a, he was a celebrity, yes, but we had a lot of fellows from Illinois, Charleston, Illinois, because we the Barville group went there, Orangeburg, Kentucky. We had a lot of guys that run from there. We went to Orangeburg. We had guys from uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. We went there, and like you say, the trophy days, those races, so just like Saturday night. <coughs> well, part of what you've touched on, Paul, is, is, is innovation. <coughs> uh, some of you know I, I retired as a, as a college professor at, out of Texas A&M. And my frustration in the last several years with my incoming freshmen in the engineering programs is they're not competitive. Well, he's lost they're minimalists. They're not problem solvers. They're, they're not innovative about anything, yeah. and so there may be one out of a hundred students that come through that I might consider hiring. We've lost that, and so so just what Paul's described real quick is that, well, we got a group that would take a <clears throat> take a V-twin Harley and cut it in half. We got somebody that decided, let's take a Mercury outboard motor and, and <laughs> make a race, racing engine out of it. Well, let's take a, let's take a Coney. Well, the Cushman works fine, but it gets hot, so let's water cool it. The, the innovativeness that went on, uh, the Anzani engines, and, and I don't know, all kinds of stuff that, that have showed up. All kinds of interesting gearboxes, all kinds of clutching mechanisms, uh, the fuel systems. Um, just it, the innovativeness I was watching as a kid uh, impressed me that Wow, maybe that's the way everybody is. Everybody's kind of a semi-machinist in, in, in inventor, and maybe that's what you ought to do. And so I, I have some patents on some devices. I didn't, I didn't know you weren't supposed to go out and invent stuff either. But I, I think we've got a generation now that's lost it. Even though we have 160 drivers that show up every weekend to run Tulsa, uh, they don't build their own chassis. There's one or two guys that maybe have. Everybody else buys them. They all run motorcycle engines. And so, do you want to run a Honda or a Suzuki or a Yamaha? Pick one. Uh, all the cars have to weigh the same. Uh, the same. You buy all the pieces now. And so, it's kind of like uh, the street rod sort of business. Back in, in, in our day, I'll just throw us all in the same pot trying to build a street rod is you had to go find all the, all the junk parts. You had to get this engine to fit this chassis to work with this transmission to somehow hook up to that rear end to make this sort of work and you had to wire it yourself. And now today, if you want to build a street rod, you get whatever street rod catalog you want a 1932 Ford. There's the chassis, there's the suspension, there's the rear end, there's the engine mounts already in there. It's already pre-wired and so you can, you can buy, it's now kit building. 
So not, not to put down some of the racers of today, they just have it nicer. But I think we kind of miss some of that, I do, miss some of that innovativeness, that creativity, and the, and the open rules. I was reading some of the original rules on the wall over there earlier. The car had to weigh 320 pounds. And that uh, couldn't be any longer than so much, and, and it had to be two-dimensional sort of things. End of discussion, you know? And, 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 and we did the same thing in the go-kart racing. So if you could get a McCullough chainsaw engine to work better than you could at power products, then better than a Clanton engine or better than something else, that's what you did. Now all of the racing stuff in go-karts are all spec engines that come from one or two manufacturers. So that's, that's got to change. Yeah, come on. If you look at any innovations, oh, anybody, yeah, absolutely. however, what you guys did, to do that now, it's corporate. It's yes. Corporations do it. It's not in your garage. It's not in your shop. It's got the innovation now. Right. It's all corporate. None of it is individual, except maybe some people. But it's practically all. Yeah. It, no more yeah. individual. Yeah. So this is almost like the last time. I mean, the closest is custom cars when they yeah. when they go building really custom cars. Yeah. I mean, really, that's about the closest I can think of. But that's why you miss it. And the thinking is yeah. also corporate now. Yeah, and I, I think one of the finest collections of, kind of, uh, of equipment and, and uh, in, indicative of, of what was going on back then is, is what, what Kenneth has been able to amass at Prairie Song. And so if you want to see the old machine shop with the leather belts that drive everything and old-fashioned <coughs> shapers and a whole lot of files because that's how everything kind of fit, or even uh, some of the stories we hear about uh, uh, Johnny Pearson using a coffee can to melt aluminum and he poured the coffee can and that, that became the starting point of, of, of his piston. And so the idea that any of us today would ever do that or use any of the equipment, I, I've looked at some of, some of Kenneth's archives of what he's collected at Freysong, is that I'm, I'm amazed that we've made anything of, of that quality. But it takes the brains and, and that engineering sort of stuff that, that Bob and, and some of the others had uh, and, and uh, Woody Connors. Well, looking back in 1965, Ford Motor Company put a twin ID suspension on their pickup. Mm -hmm. Well, the same year, Bob decided he'd make that part suspension on a match. Yeah, it worked. Well, so, Ford, you know, Ford should have talked to him because they never got it to work very good on the truck. Yeah, so maybe they should have been talking to Bob. Because. Yeah, they had a problem complaining about something. Yeah, that was part of the fun, really. Was, yeah, uh, it was. Everybody was trying to get five old mile an hour, you know, right. yeah. and uh, some things worked and some things didn't, and uh, it was kind of a fun yeah. thing. I was working at the Studebaker garage, mm -hmm. and right next door to us was Interline Auto Supply right. before they moved down on First Street to the new building. But uh, the guys, I knew all the guys over there, and I knew some of what I was doing, and one thing in particular I remember was uh, I had tried something that didn't really work out and Monday morning I got a phone call. They, well, they called me to the phone. Well, it was a guy from Interline and they all sang the Mickey Mouse song to me over the phone. But <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, who remembers the duel with the tars on the right rear? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I used that story in several leadership classes. Do yeah. you understand the rules? He was within the rules. Yeah. It said you, you said you had to have four tires. He had four right. plus one. Didn't say he couldn't have That's plus right. one or plus ten. That's it right. said you had to have four. One, two, three, four. And that'd be under that certain width. That's right. Yeah. And it met the rules. Met the rules. And it, it, we, we've got we got young people today that don't know how to do that within rules. I, I've taught for almost twenty years now for for the military, and I taught for a long time for OSHA. And so part of what you have to do is you've got to read the rules. Whether it's a Navy rule, an Army rule, or an OSHA rule, you've got to read the rule. And, and sometimes there's, there's a difference between you should or you shall, or you must or you will, or that sort of stuff. I think I got pretty good at reading those rules because I like what Johnny and some of them did back in the day. Well, here's the rules. Yeah. Got it. 
I got four tires. But when he showed up with that with that extra fifth tire on that right rear, I could hear it squeal all the way down to Middle Ark Avenue. It was off the seat up. Because you knew Johnny was on the track with that old hard rubber tire was just a squealing. I don't think he ever lifted. I doubt it. When, uh, when, even with that twin coming. Yeah, I think you have a question over there. He's being polite. Oh, I'm sorry. Rick, Rick being polite. Okay. I was just wanting to discuss. When I first started, there was a few of the rear engine cars left, but they mostly went to the side engines. Up. And yeah. I, I don't know who really started them. I mean, John Pickle, or you know, I think it was kind of down in there. But, uh, you know, and they like the, I think it kind of, the motorcycle engines really became popular then because Yamaha had those water cooled road race twins. 250 cc and you had a clutch i mean you could yeah. kind of slip that clutch in the corner and get you around the racetrack a little quicker mm -hmm. and that was that was the 19 1980s when i started what was what were the horsepower so whether we had a twin mercury or we had a twin koenig or we had a really wonderfully modified split harley's single what kind of horsepower do you think we were peak horsepower were we talking about those engines of the day well i thought they always said they were 45 horsepower 45 <coughs> on the twin 20, 45 on the twin mm -hmm. so a few weeks ago here at the museum we, we had a bunch of young kids here and, and we talked about the uh, racing and, and and micros and a little bit of that stuff and we had some fun with them and, and the kids were really great when we're now starting them at age six and they start in the junior sprints. Those are 18 to 20 horse at age six. By the time we're at, eight, I think it's 10, eight or 10, eight or 10, eight, nine, 10, somewhere in there, you can run a restrictor, which is a 600cc four cylinder with restrictors that are 45 horse. Remember what we were doing in Koenig Twins yes. back in the day. We're starting kids eight, nine years old with the same horsepower with a six-speed transmission and a slipping clutch. Yeah, there's even a lot of them running on four-mile track. Yes. The good news is we don't have to push start them anymore. <laughs> We've kind of gone to a Curtis sort of thing. They've got a battery and a starter now. But we're starting kids at that age with the same stuff we were tipping our hats with to, to the Claws and, and uh, to the Sawyers and, and all of them for, and John and others for doing really great jobs with those 45 horsepower screaming machines and we're starting kids at that. The A class, what they now call an A class, uh, in, in a transition they called it multi, so when we went from singles to others, we started calling them multis, and so the old timers like Bobby Sawyer and others are now still called multis. But the A-Class is a stock class, so if you have a Yamaha engine, it has to have Yamaha parts in it for many years, but, but as long as it's all Yamaha or a Honda engine with all Honda parts of any year or modification, or, they just all have to be done. That's stock, that's A-Class. So there's 105 to 110 horse. That's what old guys drive now. We start at 110 horse. And we don't have a... We don't have to worry about a whole lot of gear changes anymore. If you don't like that one, just shift it into another one. Here you got six. Pick another one. So now the outlaws. Uh, an, an underfunded outlaw right now, uh, 600cc, will run about 145 horse. I saw one on the dyno the other day, about 162 horse. That's in a 750 pound car with drive. Now they got wings. And they're, they're 750 pound cars. But that's where we come. But I, we've been talking about some of these wonderful inventions and engines, but that's now where we're starting our kids. And it's just, I don't know, maybe I've not been giving them enough credit. Uh, but that's, that's pretty amazing that we've, we've come that far. Let's take a break and we'll come back and, and we'll do some more pit racing and talk about some more of the personalities that are involved.